Welcome to the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. My name is Natalie Nidham. I'm a nutritionist, a human potential, and epigenetic coach, and I created this podcast to bring you the latest ways to take control of your health and longevity. We cover it all, from new technology to ancestral health practices, personalized interventions, and a very special interest of mine, peptides. Enjoy the show. In this episode, I get to interview Jean-Francois Tremblay, owner of CanLab Research in Montreal and a frequent guest on this podcast. Today, we get to talk about Livagen and a trio of peptides, all of which are really amazing tools when helping out our liver, that hardworking organ that very often gets forgotten. Livagen is a bioregulator peptide, whereas the other three peptides, which CanLab actually combine into one vial, are peptides that have been shown in research to be helpful in dealing with fatty liver disease, the non-alcoholic kind. So fatty liver disease, not coming from alcoholism, but from obesity or excess sugar consumption, basically more of a metabolic type of dysfunction. So it's a great discussion, lots of good ideas in there. But of course, I have to remind you, dear listeners, that none of this information is intended to diagnose or treat disease. It's all for information purposes only. And if you have any medical conditions that you're dealing with, make sure that you speak to your physician and primary caregiver before you take any action. In the second part of the podcast, we have a discussion about the quality of peptides, how to assess where your peptides might be coming from. And we talk also about some of the metrics used in assessing what's in that vial. What's that little white, tiny little itty bitty bit of white powder that's in the vial. So we talk about the HLPC and we talked about the COA, which is the certificate of analysis and why Jean-Francois considers that piece of paper, not always the best place to put your trust. Bottom line, you got to trust your supplier. In any event, I'm not going to stand between you and this content any longer. All I'm going to say that if you enjoy this podcast, then please, please, please take a second and leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be seen. And that's what ultimately helps us to climb the ranks, which again, helps me to get amazing guests and deliver you great content week after week. So thanks for being here and enjoy the episode. Well, hello, Jean-Francois. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi. It's been a while. It has been a while. I mean, I think we've both been very, very busy, but especially you. So it's nice to see you again. It's actually been at least a couple of months since we've recorded Mm. together. So always a pleasure and always learn a ton when we have you on the podcast. So thank you for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks to you. In tonight's episode, we have a fairly tight list, but we don't know how long we're going to be. We're committing to keeping it short, but we'll see. Anyway, so what we're talking about tonight is a couple of things. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the liver. And we're talking about peptides that specifically deal with what's becoming an epidemic condition in the liver, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's really when the liver starts to build up fat and makes it essentially hard for the liver to do the work that it needs to do. And if there's one organ in the body that we know Well, there's a lot of organs in the body that are critical, but without the liver, not a whole lot goes on. So we depend on our liver for pretty much everything, but definitely for processing toxins. Do you want to start with the bioregulator or do you want to start with the fatty liver? Well, I'd like to start with this little introduction about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people know about it, but just to make it clear. Yeah, and why? Uh, For sure. Let's talk about that. uh, It's a four stage condition. Basically, it's related to the accumulation of uh, fat fat in the liver, basically. So people may think, well, you know, no big deal. Well, yes, there is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because at the the beginning, uh, a simple fatty liver, it's kind of harmless, basically. It's not good, but that's not going to kill you. But as it builds up slowly, it's going to impede liver function. And eventually, it's going to turn into a a non-alcoholic fatty liver, or they call it steatohepatitis. Yeah, non-alcoholic fatty liver. And then if it gets worse, because 
okay, that fat and the, uh, well, fat intra-abdominal in general with all the organs is, uh, it's not a good thing in general because it promotes a lot of inflammation. But, you know, and locally and generally, locally in that case for the liver. So you have a lot of inflammation in the liver which causes uh, eventually fib uh, fibrosis uh, mm -hmm. in the liver, uh, scar tissues. Uh, the liver is still able to function, but eventually, if it continues, it turns into cirrhosis, which that's more known from people who drink alcohol. So it happens after many years of inflammation of the liver and fatty livers. Actual scars are formed on the liver, and the end result of it is uh, you die. Yeah. I think what's important also for people to understand is it's not just alcohol that will lead to fatty liver disease. No, that's the thing. That's, that's why, why they call it non-alcoholic. Exactly. Uh, the thing is, the culprits are the classic one. You know, you have uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, high cholesterol, kind of uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, it, it used to be a disease that of people of uh, 50 years and older, you know, because yeah. the, the accumulation. But lately, I would say in the last de decade, a bit like diabetes type 2, we now start to see young people, young adults and even, uh, even adolescents. Kids. Yeah, kids. Young kids. And, and, and the culprit of that basically is fructose. Fructose is yeah. really bad. <laughs> for the liver. And just imagine those kids, you know, they go to McDonald's, they spend, you know, they hang around all afternoon, free soft drink, you know, you refill as much as you want. Yeah. Uh, Coca-Cola, whatever, full of fructose, bang. Uh, well, so and, and actually let's distinguish, it's not just fructose as you find in, in fruit. We're now talking about high fructose corn syrup, which takes fructose up to a whole other level. Yeah, it's well. like uh, fructose on, on, uh, on steroids. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. basically, uh, j just to pinpoint that fructose is is uh, is one of today's biggest challenge in our society. Basically, try to get people to understand that. Uh, so basically, those are the stages, and it affects now different stages more than 25 percent of the world population yeah. so it's it's a huge uh, problem we're facing as as a society now it can be taken care of that there are many approaches the nutritional approach obviously by improving your diet losing weight uh there are a series of supplements that are good and even uh, natural therapies that are good yeah. even fasting uh, Fasting's fasting, really inter yeah. intermittent fasting is good. Yeah. But here today, I'm here to talk about peptides. So which peptides could be used to treat that problem or help or support any other treatments uh, or protocol you're doing? So basically, we're talking about uh, liver peptides. One of the first that comes to mind is the bioregulator peptide, Livagen. Yeah, I have a I have a good friend who uses Livigen and she refers to it as silk in your body. She said, and she also said when she was using Livigen, she didn't get hungry. Her blood sugar, she felt was just super stable through the day. Now, this is someone who's coming in with a very healthy liver at a baseline. For her, she may have felt the effects a bit more than someone who's coming in with a liver that's not quite as balanced. But definitely, I think what people can expect from Livigen over time is that it would be, I don't know, I, I call it like a bit of a tonic for the liver almost. Back at uh, in university in biochemistry, I had a professor. He was kind of uh, one of the international specialists on, on liver biochemical processes. And he used to tell to say to us, he says, if I ask a question or if anybody asks you a question about any biochemical pathways, where does it happen? And you don't know? Liver. Just say it happens in the liver. 90% <laughs> of the time you'll be right. So, you know, nice. yeah. Uh, so the, the liver is that important in, uh, in our metabolism. Absolutely. So uh, back to Livigen. So should people be using Livigen as a, so the bioregulators, typically we talk about doing 
depending on your age and stage, you might do one or two or maybe three cycles a year. You know. Yeah, that's and I talked about that before. Those are preventive protocols. Exactly. Yeah. Which is really called for twice a year, a basic dose age that is pretty much the same for all of them that a lot of people know already. Uh, now, if you want to use it to treat a condition related to that organ, uh, we look at uh, for a short period of time, you're looking at higher dosage yeah. for a bit longer period of time. And I would say, actually, the length like any therapy, you know, you any peptide you're going to use, because I, uh, we see those questions pop out many times. You know, yeah. How long do I need to use a peptide? Well, basically, it's a ter therapy. So you use it until the condition is healed. Or, uh, or in your words, the famous Jean-Francois quote, quote, until you get better. <laughs> yeah. You know, basically, because you're in a therapy. So why stop yeah. in the middle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, so how high dose would you get those? So, you know, like a typical bioregulator, and we can talk a little bit about dose on this one. Typical bioregulator usually is five milligrams a day for about five, days, yeah, to 20 days, like five to 10. Some people they do 10 for 10 days every day or 10. You know, there was a pulse recently, you know, one, it could be 10 milligrams every second day, every third day. Kevin sent tweaked with a different, protocols, sometimes for a total of 50 milligrams, sometimes for a total of 100. Yeah. It tweaked a little, not too much, but so that's why people, they, they, they see one study and they say, oh, that's different. Yeah, it's different, but it's within uh, what was done and it's, it's good to, you know, it's another yeah. approach uh, done by the same guy. So, but basically a total protocol is... Uh, 10 to 20 days, a total of 100 milligrams. Okay. Uh, what I've seen in therapeutic use, we're looking at 20 to 40 milligrams per day to get wow. uh, 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 a strong therapeutic effect from those peptides. Okay. That's impressive. Yeah. Again, uh, I'm saying you, you want to use it for the whole time of the therapy, for many reasons, one of them being the cost of the therapy, you may not use that full dosage for the whole therapy, maybe for a month, kind of right, right. kickstart the whole processes of uh, regulating, and then drop back to maybe a, a lower dosage to, to continue to do the work, but have to look at a higher dosage and for a longer period of times. So when people are using Livigen like this therapeutically, would they also, would it also be a good idea for them? And I'm guessing the answer is yes, to also be addressing diet and lifestyle and maybe, you know, using supportive things like milk thistle or, you know, some of the herbs and supplements that we know, like you're basically stacking on top, right? Like, yeah, of course. Guess, because people keep asking, and, and the reason I'm asking this, I know the answer to this, but I know that people, they want to know, they want to believe that, oh, I can use this and I can keep drinking my bottle of wine every night. Even lower dose alcohol can lead to a slow buildup. Exactly. Uh, well, you know, the therapy is not the peptide. The peptide is part of the therapy. So when I talk therapeutic use of a peptide, it's a therapeutic use within a more global therapy for anything. Peptides, the way I see it for most conditions are still tools among others. And they, they add many times a much stronger effect, but not to discard the rest to the contrary. So yes, if, if, uh, uh, you always have to look to as why the condition started. So, of course, yeah. if it's overweight or the diet or any condition that started that condition, until you, you, you take away the, the reason of the condition, I mean, unless you want to be on, on leverage and at, at 20 to 40 milligrams a day for the rest of your life, that's going to be quite expensive. Nobody wants that. Yeah. And you bring up a good point because I have a client who, you know, is dealing with some pain issues and struggles to stay off NSAIDs, which are very damaging to the gut. 
And so in that case, although we're not able to completely get rid of the NSAID, which to your point is the insult to the yeah. gut, by using a, a peptide, like for example, a BPC-157, we're at least for the time being, until we can address yeah, of course. the cause, we're mitigating the damage that the that the NSAID is doing to the stomach. So we're not solving the problem completely, but in some ways we're kind of, we're helping the body to deal with the insults a little bit better. So. Because listen, truth is people, they know. Uh, people with fatty liver, they just read, on, they go on the internet half an hour. They'll know why they have the condition. Oh yeah. Very much. Sure. Probably they are overweight. Their diet is not so good. And. They turn to therapies, they turn to uh, solutions to not have to do the work. Yeah. The work, basically. You know, lose some weight, uh, improve your diet, do some exercise. It, it always comes back to the basic stuff. Uh, there is no, and nothing, there is no magic pills. You know, you, you still have to do those things. Just that adding peptides and other therapies, you're going to, have things happen much uh, better and much faster. Absolutely. But by themselves, it, it, it's like me, I, I compare. If you take a smoker uh, taking 100 pills a day of antioxidants and all kind of things, well, I'm sorry, it's not going to cut it. First, you need to stop smoking, period. Yeah. And that's it, you know. And in biohacking in general, I found counting myself in. Uh, we're kind of lazy people. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we look for... That's not, uh, that's not untrue. Yeah. Well, lazy in the sense that, well, men more so. Uh, that's why we're very inventive. You know, we try, okay, what pill or injection could I take so I wouldn't need to train, for example, you know, gain some muscles and this and that. I won't name him, but one of the worst case of that is... Uh, one podcaster is known to be to hate training, so it it, it will uh, is doing all kind of things to to build his muscle mass and everything without training or to keep it like okay twenty minutes a week. You know that's yeah. that. well anyway. No, it doesn't work like that. But there's a certain <laughs> you know, point and, and talking of work. training, one there is uh, even for bone density too. You know, there is a mechanical factor to it. You know, you could have uh, osteoporosis, but by starting training, even if you're deficient in calcium, not to a huge extent, you will improve bone density just because of the physical stress on the bones. Yeah. So you will force the bone to, to strengthen because you put stress on them. And, and there is no other way, you know, you need to do something to, 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 to apply that physical stress on the bone. Same thing with muscles, same thing with organs, you know, uh, organ or stressed. And, and actually that's how, you know, uh, the best way to know, uh, 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 organ is in term uh, it's to challenge it yeah. you, know, you, you, you can take your blood glucose in the morning and it would be perfect but then you could do a challenging test of your pancreas where you take you know that classic test you take 70 grams of uh, <laughs> glucose and then yeah. look at how your pancreas respond and even if your mar morning fasting glucose is good, you can find out that your pancreas is not responding well at all. Yeah. So you, you really know the state of an organ once you stressed it and you see how it responds. Uh, it's a whole thing, basically. Yeah. No, and on the bone front, I mean, I've got that, you know, mm -hmm. and I've never been so happy to hear that gyms are reopening as I was this week because... At the end of the day, and I mean, I'm a person who had very dense bones mm -hmm. and, you know, all of a sudden it, it's very small and very slight, but it's starting to show that my bone density is starting to go down and mm -hmm. I can take all the D3 and K2 in the world. I can take all the calcium and magnesium I want. There is nothing that's going to give, and, and it's about sending your body the signal. Exactly. Easy. And, when it and then to all life, those things you're going to do around that will support it. So it's going to happen faster and better. That, yeah. That's 
Exactly. So anyway, that's a little parenthesis. So when you have a situation like fatty liver, yeah, yeah, you're going to take the peptides. You, you're going to do part of the more global therapy with a diet, some supplements that are really good for that too. It's going to make everything happen faster. But you need to attend that. Why did you get the, the, the fatty liver to begin with and fix that? Absolutely. Because okay. otherwise you fix it. And as soon as you stop Come everything, right then, then it comes back. You know? Absolutely. So, Okay, so we talked about the bioregulator, which is uh, Livagen. Livagen. Um, and looking into the literature, it turns out that about 10, 15 years ago, they came across a bunch, a lot of peptides that were really good for the fatty liver situation, where they would uh, protect against the accumulation and fat of fat in the liver, even though you have a high fat diet. Okay. Or if you have the fatty liver, it helps to uh, clean, so to say, the liver. Uh, funny thing is between, let's say, roughly 2000 and 2010, there is a lot of research that has been done on a multitude of peptides mm -hmm. and they all went under the radar because back then there was no interest in peptides. So some research group somewhere, they looked into it. They say, Oh, look, it does this. Wow. It's nice. They published and that was it. You know, nobody showed the uh, interest. So I kind of dig, uh, some of them, and I, I came with uh, three of them actually that seemed the most promising, yeah, in terms of therapies. Uh, they don't have names, so it's the, back to alphabet soup here. Yeah, it's <laughs> the letter code, you know, like yeah. G is for glutamin, you know, so it's a G P A T A F L R. That one comes, it's a plant extract, actually, it's naturally synthesized in plants. And then there, there are two other peptides, the LRP and the LQP. Yeah. They, uh, they exist naturally in the wheat brand. And those really? two, it's interesting because the researcher, knowing that wheat brand was actually good for fatty liver, they say, okay, let's look in what's in there that makes mm -hmm. it so good for the liver. And they isolated those two peptides, studied them separately, and they found, oh, yeah, it's, uh, it is working. <laughs> so in the studies that they did, how long did they use the peptides for? Um, I would Their need sense? to go back to those studies. I actually have them in front of me now. I don't see it like right off the top of my head. Okay. But uh, what I see, it does work. And funny part, the three of them, they were given to mice. And they're drinking water, so they, they work. It was or orally bioavailable. To what percentage? I don't know. I would still promote them to be injected for the simple reason that, it, like BPC-157, yes, it's orally active, but you lose a lot in the process. Right. Uh, if you inject, you get 100%. Again, usually peptide therapy, it's not the cheapest thing to do. So you want to get the most out of them. So I, I strongly would suggest to take them um, injected. Okay. Uh, that's why, to you know, like for the first one, the long one, GPE, TA, FLR, the, the, the human dosage would be about six milligrams a day to okay, have so the therapeutic not, effect. Not. So probably injected two milligrams would do. Okay. That's what right. I would figure. Yeah. And the other ones, actually, I didn't do the calculation because they talk about percentage. They don't give dosage. They, they just put 0.20% solution in drinking water and they let the mice drink freely. So that there is no actual dosage of them. But by, you know, an educated guess, I would go around the same dosage, one to two milligrams a day of, uh, of each. But that's interesting because that means that if the mice got to drink freely, it would imply, don't know for sure, but it would imply that the toxic dose, if there even was one, would be really high. Oh, no, they, no, they no. with those, no, no. There's none, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, there is no toxic dose. Actually, is there any peptide that has a toxic dose? 
Not that we know of. This uh, again, you know, they tried to find a toxic dose for thymus in beta 4. Yeah, they they went up to <laughs> 1.26 grams per day for 14 days. And they concluded, well, no, it's, it's all good. Uh, Not going to work. Yeah. Uh, in terms of toxicity. So then in terms of these three peptides, do you have... Like these are relatively new. There's not a lot of, you know, there's not much data for people to go on. Have you seen uh, people use them and, you know, how fast they seem to, assuming that they're going to do the work along with using the peptide. So they're going to make the dietary changes, the whole nine yards. Do you have any sense of how long the therapy goes? And would people, would you recommend that people have an ultrasound like, because it's ultrasound usually that yeah well i know of some practitioner that like very successful ones through uh iv therapies mm -hmm. they could literally fix a fatty liver in a month with this stuff no not with this with oh okay uh acetyl uh carnitine injected i think yeah. and yeah. a few a few other things like amazing results so it can be fixed pretty fast, actually. Mm -hmm. So I would see peptides working in that range of things. Well, maybe one to three months, something like that. Yeah, I would, yeah, to be realistic, one to three months, correcting diet and along uh, a few other things. Yeah. That's amazing. That's that's pretty awesome. Well, that, that's, that's about those three. They, they, they're very specific for the liver. Uh, actually, but one of them, the LRP looking to, there is a couple of studies that has been done. It, it's funny, and it's Carl Lanore who pointed that out uh, in one of his uh, podcasts, where small peptides like this one, three, four, two amino acids are the most... The most powerful. Uh, yeah. Not powerful, but they have different effects in the body everywhere. Yeah, the pleiotropic effects. How they exactly. And, and it turns out that uh, the LRP, I think, or the other one, I don't remember, uh, actually has very good effects on the brain too. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. probably really good effects other places in the body, but nobody looked for it. But I, I wouldn't be surprised because th those little three, three, four, like GHK peptides, you know, they, they have effects everywhere. Yeah, yeah. What would make someone use one over the other of these three? Do you have uh, a No, me or? actually, uh, on, the, on the commercial side, we just mix the three of them in one vial. So bang. Yeah, it's one vial with the three of them. 10 milligrams of each and each so you get a total of 30 milligrams right uh in the vial and you get the three of them same dose so you know i say uh, if you're to use them use them all oh that's really interesting okay so you've already and what is what is it called on your site <laughs> which which alphabet letters did you pick <laughs> g-p-e-t-a-f-l-r plus l-r-p plus l-q <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, they don't have a name. So what can I do? <laughs> All right. Okay. What can you do? <laughs> Probably a lot of people, they saw it and they say, well, what the, is that? You know? Would it have any, like, for example, people who've been using certain medications and drugs like statins or whatever for a long time, that has a negative effect on the liver. Do we know if these in any way would support the liver or is it are they very, very specific to fatty liver? Maybe the livagen would be something that would help someone with that kind of liver stress? Yeah, I would go in those cases, I would go with livagen, okay. who is more of a regulator. So it will bring back up what was down and not so much a, a condition, but the liver has been banged at the, metabolically, right? Uh, not physically, like fat in the liver. Yeah, and that has an effect on the metabolism. So, no, yeah, I would go more for uh, livagen in that case. Okay, now that and, makes and, sense. And, and without forgetting, too, thymosin beta four and BPC one five seven, they're very good for the liver too. Absolutely, and those aren't even two or three amino acids long, those, yeah. two, but they have such broad ranging like the mm. kidneys the liver like uh, so many or the for, heart uh, everything internal organs they're good for everything so yeah okay great so you know it would be a multi peptide therapy but i see somebody who would use all of them mm -hmm. could uh, along with a 
good diet and probably some good supplements that are known to support, uh, they could fix a problem like pretty fast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it. I mean, it always depends how far along the disease process you are, of course. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, but comparatively, relatively quickly. Okay, great. So is there anything else we need to tell people about these peptides or are we ready to w- move on? No, to that's, that's, uh, that, that's pretty much it. You know, it's that's more it. so people, they know it exists and if they see the need for them, no, they, they know it exists. Okay. Personally, I'm looking forward to trying the Livigen myself, but... Um, <laughs> I'm really, you know, very interested in these three for fatty liver. Okay, so moving on, we're now going to talk not so much about a specific peptide, but this is going to be like our public service announcement part of the podcast, where we're going to talk a little bit about the quality of peptides that people are getting. What is it that they want to look for, especially for people who might be buying peptides from research labs. We all know where my my favorite lab is. It lives in Montreal and <laughs> it's called Can Lab. But definitely for people who, for whatever reason, feel the need to order from other places, are there any physical features they should be looking at in these peptides? Because it's a blind item. And people, I'm, you know, in the group, the biohacking superhuman performance group, People will often post, oh, you know, here's my vial and it looks kind of funny. So what is it that people need to look out for in terms of how their peptides dissolve or anything like that in terms of warning signs? Okay. Well, actually, one warning sign that I've seen is, okay, just the general China thing. Chinese peptides one of the telltale signs that they come from China is that they have different colored caps. Right. A red cap, a blue cap, a yellow cap, and this and that. Yeah. Uh, because obviously from China, they, they ship them unlabeled, you know, and then the companies, they label them once it arrives. And then they receive an email. They say, okay, the blue cap is the BPC. The red cap is this one, and, da, 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 and they put their labels. It's one of the reasons why can lab we use only white caps. Right. It's kind of to separate us from those all colored caps things. Uh, because we know each batch what's in the vial, so we don't need to uh, the code to match. As for the aspect inside. It's hard to tell because Mm -hmm. uh, first, you know, what's at the bottom, we call it the the cake. It could have different density, different size, you know, a thin cake, uh, more fluffy, less fluffy. Uh, That has to do a lot with the percentage of mannitol they put in it. Could be anything between 2 and 5% mannitol. So if it's 5%, it's going to be much uh, hard looking cake, probably bigger, but not necessarily it has to do with the kind of pressure uh, how much negative pressure you used while you lyophilize there are so many factors and uh, it's not a telltale sign actually and just to give you again to come back to my company sometimes from one batch to another the uh, the look of uh, the, the vials the content will change interesting just because for some reason the pressure wasn't the same, you know, it wasn't controlled. You know, we don't have high tech equipment either. In the little video I posted a while ago, you can see it's it's not uh, so high tech, but it's it does the job. And there was one peptide I remember you telling me that you had figured out that it actually needs to be freeze dried like two and three times before. You can get it to the point where it's going it won't to amalgate, uh, which exactly. is time is in alpha one. We, we have to take extra care of this one because it's a bit philic. So if it's you know, it's just gonna stick together. Lyophilic the, meaning is it likes water or it doesn't like water? Oh no, a phobic. It uh, it's lyophobic. So it lyophobic. Sorry. So it doesn't a little doesn't like water. So it will have a tendency to cluster. Yeah. Instead of dissolve if it's too concentrated okay. or if there was a bit of humidity left in the vial, it will cluster even before you add water. It will right. make like micro clusters. Yeah. In the vial. 
So that, that we fixed, it's not happening. At higher concentration now, if you add water, like we did the 10 milligrams and it did happen a few times because people were not adding enough water in the vial. Yeah. So it would start to cluster. So now we're back to five milligrams per vial where that doesn't happen. It's know? easier to control. It's easier okay. to control. Fantastic. Uh, another thing that is not a telltale sign and some people they really take it for is the negative pressure inside the vial. You know, Let's some, talk about that. Yeah. Listen, basically there are two ways. Uh, what you don't want in the vial is oxygen. Uh, so the peptide won't oxidize. Okay. More so if it's kept a few weeks, a few months before you reconstitute, you don't want the peptides to have contact with the oxygen. So one of the two methods, it's once you uh, finish the lyophilization, uh, there is no air because it's negative pressure. So the air is out and you close, you know, the, 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 the cap, the, the, cap yeah. the, the rubber cap, you push the it in, yeah. the stopper. And then you have a negative, uh, less air than normal, so less oxygen. And people, they see, you know, when they put water in it, that the water is pulled in because to compensate, you know, pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way. And that's one, you can do that with one kind of equipment where you push the um, the little rubber thing. The, the, yeah, the, the rubber the, stopper. The, yeah. the, the, the stopper uh, before you take it out of the Lyophizer uh, machine. So does that create uh, the, a vacuum? Yeah, exactly. So okay. in the vacuum, there is no air, so no contact with oxygen. The other method is simply, and that's the one we use. People, they get, yeah, but we don't get that thing. Uh, so it's no good. Yeah, it's good. Because what we do is we flush. When we're finished with uh, the lyophilization, we flush the chamber with uh, nitrogen. Right. So it flushes the air out and then we cap. Yeah. So basically you get the same effect. No oxygen. It's nitrogen, which doesn't react with the peptide. So no uh, oxidation, no nitrogen, nitrogenation. Yeah. Is, that exists. You yeah. know, it's not a thing. So and so it's not a tell uh, telltale uh, sign either. Actually, there isn't <laughs> Tell, tell, uh, tell, uh, how do you say? Tell, 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 tell sign. Sign. The, the, there isn't. By the look of it, I think it would be a mistake by looking at the cake of things to judge a peptide. I, I saw those pictures in your group, and to me, it's they either it's fine. all broke up. You know, if it's shaken a big drink transport, it's going to break up the cake, it's going to move inside. It doesn't affect nothing. Okay, well, that's basically. good to know. That's good to know. I mean, people don't know, right? Yeah, so, no, exactly. And sometimes, the, you know, they imagine, oh, that, no, no, you cannot tell anything about the quality. You can tell about the production, you know, what kind of equipments may have been used, you know, if it's very, very consistent in size and everything, that means it's like they always do the lyophilization exactly the same time with the same equipment, you know, they, they have kind of a, a process set things that yeah. will give always the same end results. But it, the quality has nothing to do with that. The quality of the product at the end, not at all. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the HPLC. So people, this is uh, a certificate of quality. So people of purity. Yeah, that's two different things. The exactly. HPLC results is part of the COA, but the HPLC by itself gives you a curve. Basically, it tells you the mass of what's inside of the compound you're measuring. Yeah. The molecular mass. And then you can tell, yes, it's the right compound in it. And if you have a control, or a series of control where let's say you have one milligram per ml, then two milligram per ml, three milligram per ml, and then you always test the same quantity. You take the same quantity uh, fraction of liquid, then you will have the same peak at the yeah. same mass, but more con the more it's going to be concentrated, the, the higher the peak will be. Right, so if you have something to compare to, then yes, you can find out how much is in the vial. 
So how much of a given compound is in Yeah, that? and that's why a lot of companies, they charge you a lot the first time if you want to know quantities. Mm -hmm. Because first they have to determine those uh, standard results. Okay, uh, at one, two, three, four, five milligrams per ml, so on. So uh, to make a chart to compare now when they take the vial you give them, they can tell you, okay, the height of the curve correspond to this concentration. So we know how much there is in the vial. Uh, so that's one uh, aspect of it. The other aspect, uh, the, 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 the mass itself and the area under the curve mm -hmm. gives you the, the percentage of that peptide. Uh, it's easy because if you have an impurity, you're going to have a second peak for that impurity. So each peak is a different compound, right? Exactly. Okay. Well, Yes and no. no. What do you mean? Because you no. can have different peaks <laughs> for, for the, the same, same compound, yeah. uh, but you see it because if it's uh, ionized, but you see it on the peak, you have, um, let's say, mass 100 yeah. plus one, then you're going to have a second peak who is twice, exactly twice the mass because it's, it's double ionized so when it hits the plate that measure uh, not the mass where it falls on the plates where because it's heavier it's going to fall much lower right. so it's going to give the impression that it's much heavier but no it's not it is because of the ions but it is the same compounds and it's not that easy to read but you know with time no. you, you no, get no, it understand. sounds like it so if you have if you have like a peak of a hundred, I, I just want to simplify this for people. So if you had a peak of a hundred and a peak of two hundred, then would you assume that the one hundred and the two hundred are the same compound? If, uh, because it's going to tell you the ionization uh, of the compound. So if the first one it says a hundred plus one, and the second one it tells you two hundred plus two. Then yeah. Yes, it is the same compound. But if the second one, but then if you have a third one at 28 and a fourth one at 32, then these are, we can assume, other, they're, other they're fragments not, they're not of peptides. They're not the peptide you want, exactly, yeah. or something floating around. Uh, so those are your impurity. And the total area under all the curves yeah. comes to 100. So you, you look at the area under the curve of the main product, yeah. which hopefully is your peptide. So it may come up to 99.2. So bang. And if you do the area under the curves of all the smallest one, it's going to complete up to 100. Right. So basically, and, and a COA, Certificate of Analysis, mm -hmm. uh, what it adds up to that, it doesn't add up any information at all. Uh, it adds up to certification. So a chemist signed. And basically, chemists are part of the uh, chemist orders. Yeah. So basically, he puts his name, he put literally his career on the line, like a doctor. Right. Uh, that, you know, he certifies that the results he got and right. signs and stamp it. So that's the certificate of analysis. It's the same HPLC curve. Yeah. But confirm and signed by a chemist that is part of an order that is allowed to right. uh, sign for that. So basically he's just confirming those results, but he's not saying what the results are. So ultimately exactly. you still well, you have to understand what that HPLC is saying. Well, uh, yeah, you can, it's going to tell you the percentage. It's going to give you some data. It could. Yeah simplify you know add a page where he says okay the main peptide we're yeah. looking for you know it's gonna put it in more layman terms yeah if he wants to so you know for the the common people it, they can see okay that's what we got yeah uh, but it, it won't add up to the actual information they just a bit of interpretation and confirmed by signing and putting the seal so that's what it does. And again, you know, uh, we have been providing HPLC. We could provide COA. But the point is, I don't trust the COA from any companies. 
<laughs> so you do because, your own testing. Uh, you know, uh, it's 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 so easy to to falsify. You know, you you go on that uh, paint uh, application and you, you can change the numbers, whatever, and say, look, this is or and nobody will verify that. Actually, I'm surprised that nobody. Uh, well, I know there is a couple of group of people they started to do that and it's a good thing uh you know they send they, they buy from yeah. a company and they send it out to be tested most of the time they're not happy with the results because if we provide it to me it's not a good proof uh, it's like mcdonald telling you hey our burgers are good or it's a hundred percent meat you know nobody believes that but you understand it's like no, yeah. if you really, really, really want to be sure, you need to go third party. Yeah. So basically at one point and what's happening right now, a small group of people, they chip in and they say, okay, we're going to test that, send it to an independent lab and get a third party thing and bang, they get it. And then and, it's and completely impartial. It's not from the company they, they, themselves. They, they, where they're, they have no clue where it's coming from. They, they don't know. They just do their thing. They're, yeah non-biased yep. at all mm -hmm. and and that's it and that's why you know if you want hplc results we'll send you hplc results if it makes you feel better but again it's not a guarantee uh, of what's in the vial basically yeah. it's you still listen if you trust the company for their products an HPLC results, you need to trust that that company will send you uh, untouched results. Uh, again, I won't, I won't uh, name any company, but I've seen falsified uh, HPLC results because, you know, if it's not well done, you can tell, you know, you look. But it's been edited. Say, oh, yeah. It yeah. has been edited. So it's, it's so easy to do. And it is done. So if people want that as a guarantee that the product, well, <laughs> it's not. It's not really. And for the same reason, you know, we, we, we decided when we started the company to do a few things to separate of ourselves from the rest of the market, like using same color caps. Uh, that was the reason probably most people they, they, they didn't know about that, but that's why we're doing that. We provided once in a while some, uh, but more like, for example, that time where we had uh, melanotan too, and it came out a hundred percent pure. I mean, it, happen it happens once in a while, but it's not that you know it's rare to have that good synthesis a hundred percent. It's like a perfect synthesis. So you know, I put it up. You know, it's like look, <laughs> look what we did. So what's common? 99, 98%? What do you think people should be looking for, really? Truth is, 98 is good and up. 98 and up? Yeah, of course, the higher it is, better, but not like, okay, if you go from, again, it always comes back to clinically. Clinically, it won't make a difference. Either you have 98, 99. What's important to look for high purity mm -hmm. it's not for what you're getting it's what it's for what you're getting that you don't want you have to look into okay that one or two percent impurity what is it exactly. and then the source is important because if the the synthesis was done perfectly in a, in a legit good lab that where everything was taken care of then those impurities will be probably some amino acids floating around that at okay. one point it was decided to purify it even further with wouldn't be cost effective so right. let's say we decide we'll keep it at 99 percent and a few floating around amino acids clinically okay. you're going to get exactly the same results right as if it comes from a sh shady lab well, you don't know about the quality of the water they use. You don't know about a lot of things. And those impurity could be more than just uh, amino acids floating around. It could be heavy metals. It could be uh, other cross-contamination from other chemicals they're making around. It could be anything. Right. Uh, so... You have to be and, more cautious. Yeah, you have to so, be more cautious about that. The so bottom line it could be even 
Yeah. Bacteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So bottom line, you have to trust your source. Yeah, a little parenthesis too about the process of making peptides. It has to be done in a very clean, what we call white room and yeah. sterile environment. Some people are mistaken to think that, you know, by using bacteriostatic water, then they solve the bacteria problem. Just remember, it's called bacteriostatic water, not bacterial killing water. Anti antibacterial, yeah. Exactly, meaning that if there are bacteria in the product, it will stop its growth, but the bacteria are still there. <laughs> okay. And they're not dead. And, and they're okay. not dead. So if you inject it, now you don't have that compound, which is a small percentage of alcohol, that will refrain their growth. And you're still, once injected, you're still susceptible to growth of bacteria. So you don't want bacteria in your products. Yeah, it has to be yeah. sterile up to the last point. And that's what I, one of the things I like about lyophilization is that we can control that up to the last stage in the vial that, uh, because basic, okay, let me explain to you what we do. Okay, last explanation, because after this, we have to stop. Yes. Putting up on time. Uh, you take, let's say we're going to do time as in beta four. Yeah. We take one gram dissolve yeah. it in a small quantity of water and the last step that is done under a hut with negative you know air coming out blue light filtration white room everything then that is filtrated through a 22 micron uh, filter okay which uh, bacteria don't go through that filter okay so and then we fill the vials with let's say half a ml per little vials. And then right away we put in the lyophyzer with the little cap, it's all capped. And then up to the end. So the bacterial load is zero in those cases. So that ensure the uh, the safety of the no, it's, it's sterile. What it's you're saying sterile. Is you can a count sterile on product. that. You know, so that's why I like lyophilization. Yeah, as the last like the part right. of the process. For but sure. to show you how, if it's not well done, actually from China a few years ago, they tested bacterial loads on uh, some peptides and they found bacteria in, in the vials coming from China. And wow. more so now, they want Chinese bacteria in their peptides. <laughs> so, so even if it okay. all looks good and all that doesn't mean it was on anybody's back doesn't here. mean <laughs> it was it was well done yeah so that and, and those things you cannot see you know you look at the vial you never know yeah no for sure well and you know it's not to bash china specifically like at the end of the day it's it because as you've said many times before there's different grades of product coming out of china there's labs putting out really good quality product labs putting out lower quality product. The trouble is it's very hard to know the difference. So it's a little bit buyer beware. And I think what's important, and you said it earlier, is that wherever you're buying your peptides from, you have to feel confident that you're getting what it says that you're getting. And, you know, I think you'll, you'll know a provider is on the up and up, like someone like you would welcome, if anybody wants to test your product, you're happy for them to test yeah, your product. Sure. Like, you know? A little parenthesis. If you are to do a third-party test on any products, uh, don't only do on the peptides, do a bacterial load test and a heavy metal test. Great. Yeah. That, that, those two won't show up on, uh, on HPLC, so. Okay. You, you need to, to ask for those tests to be done too, if you want to be 100% sure of uh, everything. Okay. All right. Well, I think this has been very instructive and informative as always. I think we, we're- we, we, oh. we kept it short, eh? No, we didn't. <laughs> as a matter of fact. <laughs> anyway, so, where, so for Jean-Francois, if you're looking for CanLab peptides at all, for whatever reason, not that we were giving away any medical advice, People know that if you've got liver issues, you want to go to your doctor, you want to get diagnosed, 
you want to get a sense of what's going on. And none of this information tonight is to be construed as medical advice or diagnosis or treatment. This is all really about giving you guys information. And even, you know, if you go to your physician with this information, looking up studies, this is, this is helpful to arm you to help to, to you to take control of your health. But for CanLab, canlabresearch.com is the new URL. Not that the old one doesn't work, but that's the one that'll take you straight to the website. Is there anything else, Jean-Francois? I was just going to thank you so much for your time tonight and for being here. Anything else you think? Uh... No, that's pretty good. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll do this again soon. And if anybody has any comments or questions, I'll be posting this podcast now on all of our channels. There's YouTube, There's iTunes, Spotify, Google, and of course, in the Biohacking Superhuman Performance group on Facebook. So if you're listening to this and you're not a member of the group, come on into the group. It's a great community. It's very, very vibrant. And we often have the pleasure of Jean-Francois jumping in to answer questions in there every once in a while. Otherwise, you can find me at natalienidham.com or my new simplified URL, which is natnidham.com. That's my website. And I think that that's about it. I think we've covered it all. So once again, thanks so much and have a great night, Jean-Francois. You too. Thanks so much for joining me on this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that's what helps us to be heard and to be seen. If you'd like to connect with me directly or if you'd like to leave any comments or if you have any questions about this episode, please reach out to me directly through my website, natnidham.com. And of course, if you're not already a member of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Community on Facebook, that's where you'll find me every day. It's a short application. Just answer a couple of questions and you're in and interfacing with other amazing biohackers. Thanks again, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode.